Okay, welcome everyone uh, this beautiful afternoon. Uh, I'm happy to see so many of you join me for, for SIGOPS updates. So who we are? Um, SIGOPS updates is being led currently by three people. That's myself, Ken, and Janet. Uh, I know that Janet is looking, uh, is joining us virtually. Uh, Kenneth, unfortunately, wasn't able to join us. Uh, but those are the three people that you would talk to or that you would encounter if you join our uh, bi-weekly calls. Uh, one of us will be usually writing a call. And if you're trying to submit proposal, uh, those will be also the people that you want to talk with about uh, getting their approvals for the proposals. Uh, so like I mentioned, we do meet every, uh, every other Monday uh, at various times. I put them... Uh, on the slide, um, since uh, we're on the East Coast, that will be in uh, at noon. The next call will be happening on November 14th. So if you're interested in presenting any particular topics for SIGAPS, uh, feel free to pop up and, um, and present whatever you're interested in or whatever you're working on. We're more than happy to listen to your use cases, your problems, your issues, or even if you're having um, if you're having a PR that hasn't been touched or you're awaiting review, uh, you're more than welcome to join our calls and, uh, and bring it up to our attention. There's a lot of us, uh, there's a lot of the work, uh, but there are only a couple of us that are pushing uh, the boat forward. Uh, I encourage you to also join our, join our Slack channel. Uh, you can ping us there on the previous slide and I can probably return. Uh, or maybe even two slides back, there were our GitHub and uh, Slack uh, handles, so you can probably figure out who, who is who. Uh, alternatively, if not Slack or meetings, there's the last um, option is email group. Uh, if you want to contact us this way, or this is your preferred way of contacting with us, that's totally uh, fine as well. So. What, what do we do, what the SIGAP does? Um, I've been getting and answering that question uh, since the beginning of this week. Is SIGAP actually still doing something? Is, um, or is it stale? And the answer is, yeah, we, we are active. We're actually very active, even though the majority of the work, as you'll see in a minute, is driven by, uh, by the output from the working group batch. Um, there's still a lot of stuff that we're trying to, uh, to push forward with regards to the controllers and, um, and the applications that are uh, running on OpenShift. Um, so that's that. Uh, let me quickly, before moving forward, uh, let me quickly go through what we've been working on for the past two, three releases. What are the main issues and the main features that we delivered? So the G8 features that landed in the past two releases uh, that are worthy of mention is index job. So if you've ever worked with job by default, it will just create this many pods as you specify, but there is no ordering. Uh, you, you can't have any particular information about which pod is picking which index. So if you're thinking uh, something like a combination of a of a job and a stateful set, that's an index job. Basically every pod has a specific index assigned to it. And if it fails, it will be restarted with that number. That number is also injected into the pod. So if you want to use that number uh, for processing your data, that's perfectly fine uh, use case for that. Uh, another, uh, another feature, again, on the job API that we've been pushing forward is job suspension. Uh, we are seeing a lot of uh, batch, uh, batch workloads, and I'll be talking about the, the batch group, which I already mentioned as well before. A lot of those inputs around the job improvements is coming from the batch workloads, and they are trying to produce primitives within the Kubernetes uh, API, especially the workloads and the batch groups, mm, that will allow to create a higher level uh, controllers, which will be capable of uh, driving the, the, the batch execution in a much smarter, more, uh, more sophisticated way. 
So basically the job suspension is nothing uh, more than being able to stop the execution of, of a job. Uh, whatever was running will be, uh, will be stopped and then it will be uh, restarted at, as soon as you uh, unsuspend the job. The other two uh, features which we were basically um, aligning various controllers. Uh, some of the controllers deployment was probably the most featureful when it comes to various uh, rollout strategies uh, controller and the, the, the other controllers like daemon sets or stateful set were missing some features. So for daemon sets we worked on something that is called max search which basically allows you to tell oh that during a rollout I'm actually allowing to have more pods than uh, than nodes being rolled out during uh, during the rollout, uh, which might be useful. Of course, uh, a lot will depend on what is your particular use case, because with daemon sets, obviously, you need to be very careful because they are running one per each node. So if if a pod is uh, using specific resources on the node, which are limited, um, then obviously you won't be able to fully reuse that mechanism. So uh, have a look at it. Uh, it can improve some use cases, definitely. Uh, the other, uh, the other um, leveling up feature uh, for controllers that we did was for stateful sets. Uh, we introduced something that is, min ready, uh, that is called min ready seconds, which basically allows you to tell, oh, my pod, my application, has to be ready and running for this many seconds before I'll, um, I'll add it to the service and can serve traffic to it. So this is more for use cases where either your um, bootstrap of the application is taking some time or you wanna warm up your caches for your application and give it a little bit more time uh, than normally you would. So uh, you can delay uh, when the application is joining the, uh, the stateful set. Uh, the beta features that we uh, that we promoted over the past two releases. Uh, the first one is related with uh, deciding which pods should be removed first uh, whenever a, um, a scale down is happening in a deployment. We kind of left this one hanging for a little bit uh, for a little bit while. We're looking for more input uh, on this, but basically. Um, the current built-in mechanism works such that it will pick the youngest pod in your deployment to be scaled down, which is not, al uh, not always desirable uh, for some use cases. Uh, so we would like to have a, a user-provided input uh, and an information point how to scale down your, uh, your deployment. The other one, is again jobs, like I mentioned, Wardrobe Batch is, uh, has been pushing us quite a lot with regards to improvements. Um, it's basically exposing information about ready pods. So when you're running uh, batch workloads uh, and going in thousands or more than 100,000 pods per job, uh, it is useful if you can have enough information about which of the pods are in which states. Uh, beforehand, we only provided information about active, which is basically anything that is running or is pending. Um, there was no distinction between actually executing pods in a job, so uh, that feature exposes that information in a status. And finally, um, the time zone in cron job, which is probably the most requested features uh, within Kubernetes, literally dating back to the first implementation uh, when cron jobs were called scheduler jobs. Uh, we've been for very long um, not, um, I, maybe not necessarily not interested in not, not, a, bit, in not a good word. We were uh, blocked technically from providing this functionality because we would have to rely on user provided or cluster owner provided database with time zones, and we did not want to uh, to, inf to provide some uh, that kind of enforcement for uh, for cluster administrators. As soon as GoLang started providing their own built-in database uh, with time zones, uh, we figure out that yes, that's a point where 
we will always have the information about time zones uh, present on the cluster, even if it will be built on top of a scratch images, it will always have that kind of information provided and we can rely, and in the worst case, we will rely on the uh, Golang built-in database. So that, um, that functionality is present since 125, uh, it was promoted to beta. Uh, with 127, hopefully should G8. I haven't seen any complaints yet. But if you try it out and you don't like something, let me know. I'm very happy to hear about that. Uh, we don't have anything in alpha, which is a little bit surprising when I was present uh, when I was preparing the presentation. I thought that we had something for alpha, and we do, but it's something that we are starting to push to alpha in 126, but I'll get to that in, in a minute. So the stuff that we're currently working on, if this is something that interests you, uh, I'm more than happy to hear either after the presentation or feel free to find all the links to the appropriate features in the Kubernetes Enhancements repository, uh, which has then the further links to the implementation details. Uh, feel free to, uh, to follow them and, uh, and leave your uh, information be, uh, about that. So one of the features or a downside of the job implementation was that it required the pods uh, of a job to be around for the controller to be able to figure out, oh, I completed the job because I was looking at the, at the pods uh, that completed. We didn't have a mechanism smart enough to count the pods that were, that were completed. And uh, then, uh, yeah. So the problem was basically that if you had a job which went into thousands or more than thousands of pods, um, and a pot garbage collector, which is responsible for removing completed pots, would kick in, we would lose the information because the, uh, the pot garbage collector is responsible for removing pots which are not needed, which basically if it completed, it is not needed any longer. Um, but since the controller relied on calculating, so it would again and again create the same pots over and over again. Uh, we knew about this limitation from day one when we started implementing the jobs. And this was, uh, cr the issue was created to fix this problem as soon as possible. And the as soon as possible was since one, uh, 1 1.2 or 1.3, I can't remember when we introduced the, the job. It took us almost 20 releases to, uh, to push the feature. Aldo did a great job uh, introducing a finalizer, which is responsible for counting the pods which completed and we don't have to keep them around, which is a great improvement, especially again for the batch workloads which are running in multiple and thousands or more pods. There are two uh, beta features that we're working on for 126. One is about giving the users the ability to decide what happens with their PVCs. Currently by default, we are not touching your PVCs in a stateful set uh, because we're trying to treat all the data owned by PVC, uh, owned by stateful sets as a, something that has to, uh, ha has to uh, be maintained. But there were requests, there was a couple of users that requested these features. Um, if I remember correctly, Mark is working on this feature. And basically there is the ability to say in the stateful set spec that, oh yes, I'm fully aware that if we will be if I'll be scaling up or, scal or scaling down specifically, uh, it's okay for, uh, for the controller to remove my PVCs. But it's a explicitly opt-in. That's not a behavior that we will be changing by default in a stateful set. Uh, another feature, again, coming from the batch work group is retriable and non-retriable failures for jobs. So currently, a job controller is rather dumb in case when it comes to failures. It will retry every single failure of a pod. If a pod will end in a non-zero uh, non with a non-zero exit code, it will always retry such a pod. Even if the, um, even if the failure will be permanent, um, I don't know if there will be some execution errors or something like that, it will always retry. Uh, so that can at some, Rare cases, it can cause 
cluster exhaustion if we will be retrying the same pods over and over again. Um, so the feature is about giving the users the ability to specify, oh, these are actually the exit codes or um, information that we embed in conditions. So for example, if your pod gets evicted by a scheduler because of uh, not, sufficient not sufficient resources or by the kubelet for similar reasons, you can say that, okay, um, I'm expecting that this might happen in some cases and you don't have to retry uh, those pods. Similar for exit codes, if you write your application in such a way that you have nicely um, codified exit codes and you know that everything up until let's say 100 is a retriable error, but everything above 100 exit codes is, uh, it should not be retried because it's a fa fatal error that it won't, uh, won't, won't help and we will be just retrying uh, forever and wasting resources basically. So that API if actually adds that, uh, adds those capabilities to the Java API. It's pretty, exp uh, it's pretty big. Um, I'm fully aware because I've been reviewing that a couple of times since the early uh, alpha version. Uh, we've, in the beta, uh, the API transformed a little bit uh, we're hoping that it will be a little bit more expressive. Uh, but yes, definitely give it a try if, you, uh, if you've been planning any uh, work related with uh, um, retriable and non-retriable pairs for jobs, or you've been running some bad workloads that code that could benefit from this functionality, I'm more than happy to hear from you, especially be, uh, that this is currently at, as it will be as a beta in 126. Uh, so it will be on by default. But what is most important, uh, I would like to get at, gather as much as possible feedback before this feature goes GA because at a beta stage, we still have quite a lot of uh, flexibility when it comes to changing the API. And I know that there are some edge cases which might be uh, problematic to express in the API that we currently put together. Um, and there's a bunch of, um, alpha features that we were trying to uh, put together. Uh, there is a pod healthy policy for PDBs, which is basically, uh, we discovered recently that the PDBs are always counting every pod. Doesn't matter whether it's a terminated pod, it's a pending pod, or it's a running pod, it will always count all of those pods in your PDBs, which might be a problem for some cases. If you know that it, a pod is terminated, you might not necessarily be interested in uh, taking uh, taking that pod into your account uh, during PDB calculation. Uh, so there is a new spec, uh, spec field being added to the PDB, which allows us to, to have a little bit more wiggle room with regards to which pods should be calculated for PDB. The next one is about stateful set uh, numbering. So if you've ever worked with stateful sets, you probably know that stateful set will create this many replicas uh, as you specify, and it will start uh, counting them from number one until whatever the replicas number you have. But there are some cases if you're thinking about uh, migrating, uh, specifically migrating your stateful set between clusters, you would like to uh, be able to move pods one by one or in groups, I don't know, in group of two or whatever your application is capable of doing. For those cases, we will currently allow you to set the initial number of your uh, stateful set. So you can say that, oh, my stateful set actually should be from three to five. And we will be creating pods that will be numbered from three to five and not from one to five as in a default case. Lastly, which is something uh, very dear to my heart, and uh, we've been trying to push this feature for, for a little while now, and probably it will take uh, a couple good releases still in the future, uh, is consolidating the controller's statuses and uh, conditions. So controllers, all of the controllers were written by different people. I'm trying to think, I'm don't think there was a single person that wrote at least more than one controller. Uh, usually there were various people at various 
um, stages of Kubernetes maturity. And the downside of that approach was that we did not have unified um, approach how to express the information about where my workload is in its life cycle. Um, which if you're working with just, for example, deployments, you probably wouldn't have to care. But if you're a person that's trying to build something on top of the current controllers, then if you have to codify separately for deployment, separately for stateful sets, separately for, uh, for daemon sets, to differently um, read what the status means, what the condition means, uh, it is getting a problem, uh, it is becoming a problem because you need to know what controller you're working with to be able to, uh, to properly operate it at a higher level. Uh, ideally, we would like to have uh, the ability to say, oh, if an app is ready, it's ready. It doesn't matter with it, whether it's a uh, stateful set, it's a deployment daemon set, we should have a way to say in a consistent way that yes, deployment daemon set, uh, stateful set is ready and I can fully rely on that. That's not a thing currently. And we've been putting together a proposal, we've been discussing on various uh, spaces. We've, been, we've raised this topic a couple of times during the SIG apps calls. Uh, we've raised this topic with um, API machinery and API reviewers. Uh, because we are trying to um, add to the existing API, which is probably the biggest issue at this point in time. So if you have your opinions, uh, I'm more than happy to hear about them. Uh, there is a cap uh, open about this issue. Feel free to have a look at it, leave your comments there. Uh, every kind of input is more than, uh, more than welcome. Uh, before I close the call, we still have a couple, about a couple minutes and I wanna leave a little bit of time for questions. There are two topics that are very important for the overall stability of the project and controllers uh, as well. Uh, I point, I'm pointing and you can get the links uh, if you open the slides which are already uploaded to the sketch. One is about the increased rel reliability bar so that basically means every single PR, don't be surprised if you will be pushed back with asked to add more uh, tests for your PR that is fixing some area, even if, um, even if you're touching some area and not necessarily uh, the tests that you are being asked to provide uh, are touching the stuff that you're modifying. The reason for that is there are some areas, controllers are roughly okay-ish in some areas that I remember, but there are some edge cases that we are not, uh, we don't have them covered as, uh, as much as we would wish um, in, the, in the unit test especially, because that's the simplest uh, feedback that we can get when you are changing any kind of controller. And the more uh, confidence we have, the better obviously for us if we can deliver features because if if reviewing a particular controller requires me to set up a cluster with your change to ensure that you haven't broken anything, that obviously takes a lot of time to be able to, uh, to review every single PR. Um, so that are, both of these topics are basically talking about that. Lastly, um, I was talking about the reviewers cohort that um, we started a couple months back. And I see Heba here. Um, Heba is one of the folks that we are trying, uh, we're trying to mentor and uh, teach how to review uh, the controller PRs. It's not an easy thing. I would say that's one of the toughest areas still in the Kubernetes code, um, especially that eventual outcomes or the, the effect uh, of any change might, uh, might trickle to so many users as we've heard earlier today during the, uh, the, the keynote. So with that, I think that's roughly, oh yes, the, the batch work group. I did mention that a couple of times throughout the talk earlier today. Uh, so the batch group work group is basically um, a combination of uh, several SIGs that we joined efforts to improve the overall ability uh, to run batch workloads. So that's, uh, that's a cross, uh, cross cutting work from SIG apps, SIG uh, scheduling, and SIG node because 
any kind of batch related workloads affect uh, those three RERs and we're trying to improve uh, the output of all those three SIGs. Uh, we've been having uh, folks from various different uh, organizations, from various products presenting about their use cases, what they are missing on Kube, why they are building something else uh, on top of Kubernetes APIs or what kind of things they are currently missing in the Kubernetes API that we can pick up and, and improve in the long term and add to the, uh, to the core Kubernetes uh, APIs. So if you're interested or if you have any particular topics for the Bash work group, uh, feel free to ping me or any of the other uh, batch, uh, batch leads uh, or just pop up into the uh, mailing list or the Slack channel. We are meeting every other uh, Thursday and it's at 10 p.m. Eastern? I think that's wrong, that should be 10 a.m. Eastern. Uh, sorry, I'll fix the slides later on. Yes, it's a 10 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, so with that, I think uh, if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. If you're shy or anything like that, I'll be around for a little while and I'll also be at the Red Hat booth during the, uh, the booth crawl later today. So feel free to say hi or anything. Okay, thank you very much.